This is the extremely rare, non-photosynthetic, white to translucent, ghostly plant that is a parasite on other organisms, a vampire of the plant world. The vampire plant. But it is far from being only a taker in the forest. As you shall see, it's a rare gem whose presence can benefit all who stumble upon it. And its power has been kept secret to all but a few for a long time. This is the ghost pipe, or Indian pipe. I want to show you why this plant is so insanely cool, but I should start with two important points. One, you should not be tempted to use this plant at least until you've watched this entire video, but more likely until you have spent a lot of time with it. And two, chances are that if you've actually heard of this plant, you probably don't have the right information. And that's in part because everyone has been repeating the same information over and over again, and it's either not the whole truth, Oh, the medicine. It's great. Or it's a bit of a misrepresentation. They're just plain dangerous. No, no, no. But first, let's get into the woods and find it. These hills are the historic center of the Cherokee Nation. It's also where the eastern band of the Cherokee still resides. It's a vast expanse of wet mountain slopes, old trees, and a complex habitat that contains many ancient herbal medicines. These plants were the only medicines for the people that lived here until recently. One of these medicinal plants was the Indian pipe. Only recently have these herbals been replaced by modern pharmaceuticals. That shift means we're forgetting much of this wild plant knowledge. Plus, those that do know about these wild medicines often don't write about them openly, and for good reason. Giving out this knowledge can both take away the sacredness of them and can open them up for over-harvesting. Which is why I'm partly worried about sharing what I've discovered about this plant today. I'm here now because I've loved this plant for a long time. This is a photo I snapped on my birthday 10 years ago, and unfortunately, I haven't come across it again. That is, until I got a tip from a friend who lives in these mountains. This is his property, and he said, it is blooming right now, come up and find it. And I was like, okay, I gotta do that. That's incredibly cool. Off to find the Indian pipe. One tiny ghost pipe. That's two. It's number three, number four, five, and six. Nine. That's 10. That is a big cluster about two dozen different clusters that I found uh, out here. This Indian pipe video was supposed to be a simple one. Oh, wow. Holy smokes, look at that, huh? Holy cow. Oh, wow. Find it, talk about how cool the biology is, mention the medicinal compounds, the dangers, and then post it. Much to my dismay, after I went out this first time, I realized I got so much of it wrong. So I'm gonna give a little intro and I'm gonna give a little wrap. And okay, then, well, let me get in a better position. Okay. I don't like looking down on you, but oh. um, I'm... But that wasn't my fault entirely. Everyone is repeating the same information. If you look this plant up, there are two things you're likely to hear about it. One, you may read that this plant is a powerful pain reliever and nervine. Some assume it's because it has salicylic acid in it, which, by the way, acts similarly to acetyl salicylic acid, which is the active ingredient in aspirin. Plants use this hormone to mediate infection by pathogens. But an aspirin-like effect is not the whole story here. Definitely not like taking aspirin. You may also hear it has grayanotoxins and is thus way too dangerous to mess with. I'll explain more here shortly, but grayanotoxins were made famous in movies because they cause mad honey disease. What's wrong with Gladstone? Mad honey disease. It does in fact have granitoxin, and yes, this is a potential risk you should know about. But when I did my research, I found there are definitely no deaths, and there aren't any well-documented adverse reactions from the Indian pipe. That means the dangers may be overstated. I can also tell you when I tested it, something else seems to be happening. I then talked to the most outspoken herbalist I found on this particular medicine, Sean Donahue. He made me realize we are missing something. The most similar effect is low to moderate doses of psilocybin do in terms of shifting people's experiences of chronic pain. I've developed a hypothesis, but first I think it might be useful to talk about the biology. Understanding what this plant does in the wild could give us some indication as to what the plant could be good for. In the wild, we know that this plant does not produce chlorophyll. It's ghostly white because it lacks these photosynthesizing pigments. 
That means it's not getting energy from the sun. For a long time, we didn't actually know where it was getting its energy from. And then a group of researchers discovered that it was actually tapping into the mycelial network underground. As a quick refresher, mushrooms like this are just the fruiting body of the fungi. Most of the time fungi, they live underground as mycelium. And you can see them if you know what you're looking for. These white strands of mycelium are what you can see if you dig into the soil. Many are mycorrhizal fungi. And that means they form a relationship with the trees all around them, exchanging nutrients and energy with them. In many ways, they allow the trees and the entire system here to communicate with each other. Think Avatar in real life. The mycelium connect everything. In fact, researchers injected radioisotopes into the trees surrounding the ghost pipes. And those isotopes ended up in the ghost pipe. And that's because the ghost pipe is parasitizing the mycorrhizal fungi, particularly those in the family Grusalaceae. Those are mushrooms like these, and they get much of their energy from the trees. It's really an incredible cycle. Then every summer, these little flower stalks emerge out of the ground for us to see. If you look closely, these flowers look a bit like blueberries, and that's because they're in the same family, along with toxic species like rhododendrons. And this, in fact, is a rhododendron. Rhododendrons, by the way, have a toxic glycoside called granatoxin in them. In Turkey and Nepal, where there are large fields of rhododendrons, beekeepers produce honey honey that's especially high in granatoxin. This honey is called mad honey. You can actually buy it legally. And we know what a small dose of this mad honey does. It leads to hypotension and respiratory depression. Specifically, granatoxin opens sodium ion channels. And those same channels are needed for nerves to fire. We need nerve impulses to move muscles, like our diaphragm, for us to breathe. If so if you get a high dose, you could end up in the hospital, and there really isn't an antidote other than administering atropine and just taking care of the patient. In 24 hours, they usually get better. So back to the Indian pipe, which we know contains both granatoxins and salicylates. We don't necessarily know what else is in it. I can tell you now, someone else needs to study this chemistry further. But how did people use it? Well, the Cherokee used it to treat convulsions and epilepsies. That points to granatoxin. The Algonquins used it for fevers, which points to the aspirin-like effects. Modern herbalists like Sean Donahue here use it in similar ways, but have discovered it can bring people down off bad trips almost instantly. Antidotes, a psychedelic overstimulation. That I find is fascinating. Sean also notes there's a spiritual aspect to sitting in the forest with it. Go visit, sit with, feel the presence of. Given everything that I've learned, my hypothesis is there's not just one of these compounds that is leading to the still not well understood effects that we see. Perhaps the granitoxins and the salicylates and some other compounds that we don't yet know are having a synergistic effect. Plus, who knows what Sean might be onto with having a spiritual awakening in the forest. Modern science probably can't explain that very well. Although we know that the placebo effect is real. In other words, having the mindset where you think something is going to work will then help it actually work. That's pretty incredible. No matter what is exactly happening, I definitely need to say this one more time. I absolutely do not recommend that you head off into the forest and start randomly experimenting with this plant unless you have the background and the knowledge of how plant medicines work. It's just far too risky and we don't know a lot about the potential harms from these different toxins that are in the plant. With all of that in mind, there are some ethical considerations you must know. First, this is a perennial plant that will come back year after year, unless, of course, you dig it up, so never do that. There are plenty of compounds in the flowers and flower stalks for those that use it in tinctures. Now, if you ever see anyone making a tincture, remind them it's only ethical to pick it with permission of the landowner on the land you're on, and definitely not on public land. And finally, I really only recommend making a tincture for the advanced user. Sean famously retracted much of his teachings on them because he witnessed mass overharvest. Every time I spoke about the plant, even when I was very careful to talk about how ecologically sensitive it is and about how to work with it respectfully, I would see entire stands decimated. In conclusion, I think there's more to learn about this plant, more that we don't know. But I do know that it's a valuable indicator of a healthy forest. If it's in the forest, that's a good sign. I can be happy sitting with it here and reflecting on how people of the past have used it. So while it might be a kind of vampire in the forest that sucks nutrients from others, it's also part of this incredible network and something that has not only given back to the people who walk these woods, 
but its presence still gives great joy to me knowing that this incredible plant is still here. There you have it. Stay tuned for more Stone Age Man videos coming up soon. And get out there and explore yourself. We'll see you soon. It just feels like everything is wonderful and alive here. We're, we're staying down here in this house and we're up here in the forest and look what we found. Incredible like, Indian fires. We're on like the, the side of a no, edge of a cliff here. I'm like hanging on trying to <laughs> try to stay here. I know. Like the only reason you're staying there is because you've got your body like on the one flat spot. <laughs>